Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 13, 1 to 8. <laughs> Signs of the end of the age. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all those great buildings, said Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. This is the gospel of Christ. I speak this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated. Well, it's such a beautiful day out there today, and yet that reading seems to be not doing a lot for us. It seems to be a, a bit about doom and gloom and despair, as if we haven't got enough of that ourselves, with COVID and election results and power outages and climate change, and we've got our own personal problems. And so, you know, we might be thinking, well, actually, what hope is there? Everything's falling to pieces. There are probably problems, and we know there are problems, throughout the whole world. So the end of the world must be near. And many are saying that on social media, and they're saying it to each other. The end is near. The prophetic time of God has come. The clocks are ticking down. So there becomes a great field day of speculation and readings like we have this morning and which continue through that chapter of Mark get misinterpreted and they're scaremongers who go amongst us and we get concerned that the end times are here. It's sad to take God's holy word out of context. And especially when the genre that is being used in these particular uh, passages is a genre that was very understandable to first century. Not that easy for us to understand. But people keep on hearing and believing that the end is near. But if we look at God's word, it says, no one knows when the time will come. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. I think we might be being a little presumptuous to start knowing when the end is coming. We don't even know when our own end is coming. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't even know what tomorrow brings. Now, there's an old song, and, and some of you might never have heard of it. Others of you will know it immediately. It's called Que Sera, Sera. And we used to, in my day, put it on our 
LP, um, an on a gramophone and a little needle and play it along. But what it says is, que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. So let's not waste our time speculating. So I want to suggest this morning that the title of my sermon is not going to be about doom and gloom and despair and pessimism, but it's going to be about hope. Hope when all seems lost. Because my God is a God of hope and a God of restoration. And the Old and the New Testament readings today fit together so well. And we can see that very link of hope and new beginnings and the birth pangs of new life. We find it in that very first story of Elkanah and Hannah. Here we have this wonderful, devout Old Testament couple regularly going to the temple to worship, and especially when it was Jewish festivals. But poor Hannah, the wife, is troubled. She cannot bear a child. And to make it worse, Elkanah already has two sons. And Hannah is distraught about this. And the first wife, as ladies can be sometimes, was a little provocative. And she taunts her and she shames her about her position. But you see, to be childless in those times was a huge stigma. It was a social label that was put upon you. And poor Hannah pours out her grief at the temple to Eli the priest. And the priest takes time to be with her, and he encourages her, and he says to her, go in peace. The God of Israel will grant what you have asked for. And we read just those words, just that kindness, just that encouragement lifts her spirits. And verse 18 said her face was no longer downcast. And she subsequently falls pregnant and she gives birth to the child Samuel. And we read as the psalm today, her song of praise to the Lord when her child is born. And you see, her heart has gone from despair to hope and to thankfulness. And she rejoices in the Lord. She rejoices in her, his goodness to her. And she says, there is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. There is no rock like our God. From the doom and despair and gloom comes hope. From new beginnings, the pain and the suffering are put aside, and she could move forward with her life. You see, our God can work in all situations of everyday life and often contrary to natural expectations. God can bring about surprising reversals. And you see, that is hope when all is lost. New birth, new beginnings. And the New Testament follows the same theme. You see again, new birth and hope. The reading begins at the temple in Jerusalem, and the temple, of course, was the very heart and soul of Judaism. And if you know your history, you will know that the Romans were the occupying force. And so the Jewish people had no government of their own. They had no one they could go to. They had no identity. And so their whole national and spiritual identity was poured into and represented by the temple. This was their whole life. This is where God was. 
themselves. This was their whole being. This was their sanctuary. This was their holy place. Of course, it was a pretty grand building. It was made of beautiful white Jerusalem stone. If any of you have ever been to Jerusalem, you will see that white stone on some of the buildings even today. And it's a marvelous sight. It almost hurts your eyes when you see it. But this was on the temple, and the temple was adorned with gold and marble, and also the skill of many, many years. Those stones were said to be five tons in weight. Now that's like picking up two rhino at once. That's the weight of those stones. The walls were 30 meters high. That's 10 stories. Might not seem so big to us now, but in those days, that was extremely high. And so it was a picture of splendor and glory. And there is Jesus sitting with his four disciples, looking at the temple, and he says to them, you see this magnificent building? Not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Oh my word, what a statement to make. His poor disciples, they must have literally been shell-shocked. You know, how, how is that going to be possible? And they say, well, Jesus, when is this terrible thing going to happen? And Jesus, as he want to do, didn't answer the question. But he goes on to say, your temple will be destroyed. And we know that it was destroyed in 70 AD. And he said, when your temple is destroyed, people will be telling you, this is the end of the world. But I tell you, it's not the end. And then he says there will be conflicts and wars and tensions and fightings and earthquakes and famines. But it's not the end of the world. You are going to be persecuted and hunted and betrayed. But it's not the end of the world. Jesus says all this is the beginning of birth. Now, this text was probably written in about 60 CE or AD, whichever you prefer. And how many wars have there been since then? Wars and wars and wars. How many earthquakes? How many famines? The birth pains are lasting a long time. How long did Hannah wait for her child? We don't know. How long will our own personal grief or our own suffering last? We don't know. How long will COVID last? We don't know. The reality is every generation will have its own persecutions to combat its own antichrist to lure people away from the true God. And every generation will have its own natural disasters to deal with. And that will be painful. It does not mean it's the end of the world. The certainty that we have is that our God is still at work. He hasn't deserted us and left us to go spinning around out of control. God is still at work. New every morning is your love, great God of light. And all day long, you are working for the good of the world. This is our hope. Our God is present in the world, working and restoring. 
No, that rough, gnarled, old bark of a tree has at its very tip new, green, tender shoots of new life, new beginnings. And that's our vision for hope. A new future, new beginnings still to come. But for this moment in time, what we have is an unfailing love that's available to us. And it's the power and love of Christ. And it can never, ever be exhausted. It's there for generation after generation after generation. So you see, the future is not shaped by those who keep looking back to reap over what's gone or become bogged down in the gloom of the present. The future belongs to the person with faith and a vision and a confidence in a mighty, restoring God who is ever present with us now and will be forever in the world to come. So let's look for the green shoots of life. Let's look for the new little bud on the rose bush. Let's put a flower in a marmite bottle and wonder at its beauty and intricacy. Let's smile at the child who brings a new life and hope. Let's recycle a cardboard box to bring new life to creation. Let's encourage each other and give hope. There was hope for Hannah. There was hope for the persecuted church at the time of St. Mark. There is hope for us. Hope springs eternal. Amen. Let the healing grace of your love, O Lord, so transform us that we may play our part in the transformation of the world from a place of suffering, death and corruption to a realm of infinite light, joy and love. Make us so obedient to your Spirit that our lives may, became, may become living prayers and a witness to your unfailing presence. Our dearest Lord, be now a bright flame to enlighten us, a guiding star to lead us, a smooth path beneath our feet, and a kindly shepherd along our way. Today, forevermore. Jesus, Son of God, let your love shine through our eyes, your Spirit inspire our words, your wisdom fill our minds, your mercy control our hands, your will capture our hearts, your joy pervade our being until we are changed into your likeness, from glory to glory. Amen. Uh, but God bless you and keep you in the palm of